Made in Latin America. 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 Latin America. Welcome to Made in Latin America, a new podcast brought to you by the Santo Domingo Centre of Excellence for Latin American Research at the British Museum. In this podcast, you'll be listening to insights and interpretations about iconic collections at the British Museum, as well as examples from the more than 60,000 items, of which many have never been on display. Join us in this series that will deepen and challenge what you know about Latin America. This season explores the Tolintella Codex, one of the few surviving pre-Hispanic pictorial manuscripts made more than 500 years ago in the Mystic region in Mexico. In which language is it written? Why is its blue color so unique? What stories does it tell? The podcast will be hosted by two curators from the Latin America Center, Laura Osorio Sonax and Maria Mercedes Martinez Milanchi. Indigenous researchers, communities, and artists working with this codex will join us throughout the season. Hello, everybody. This is Mercedes and Laura from the Santo Domingo Center of Excellence for Latin American Research at the British Museum, and welcome to the Made in Latin America podcast. Today, we will explore a creative project inspired by the music and sounds in the Tonindaya Codex that were recorded in the Mishchek region. Ancestral instruments, sounds from nature, Mishchek landscapes are central to this episode. Just to remind you how it's going to work, me and Laura are going to have a conversation and then we'll have some comments from different specialists. And throughout the episode, you'll be listening to a creative retelling of the Tonindaya Codex read by Miguel Villegas Ventura. Lord Twal Movement's body lies under the sky for a day and a night. Once found, there is much commotion, much beating of chests and wiping of eyes. Lord Adir himself makes the funeral preparations, brings the body, lights the fire, ties the dried corpse in its garments. Respect is paid in abundance with offering and spoils. But you can't miss the man in the crowd with the blood on his hands. The place Lord Twelve Movement was killed was in the territory of Shippe Bundo, and Shippe Bundo was ruled by eight deers once true love, now black heart beating. Lady Six Monkey's own children, two boys, were still young, but the others from the first marriage were adults now. And this was a dangerous thing to be in a town where a man has been murdered. Okay, so... Um I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about music in the Tonindaya Codex. Obviously, the Codex is, you know, is, is a long narrative and it's difficult to get a sense of anyth anything sensorial such as, you know, hallucinogenic trances or, you know, or music and speech. But there are representations of musical instruments, right, in the, in the Tonindaya Codex. Yeah, lots of musical instruments are represented. Uh, for example, conch shells, which are used to call people to certain places, flutes, rattles, bells, and and some really beautiful drums. Yeah, there's some drums in the British Museum's collections. Actually, they're on display in the Mexico Gallery as well, right? These kind of like long uh, teponastles that are kind of hollow uh, and, and sort of carved with figures on the outside. Yeah, and they're carved with bits of narrative also, which is interesting. So sort of narrative within the narrative. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I've always been interested in in those instruments, but um, but so but that but that's a very sort of clear link between what we have in terms of material culture and what we see in the in the codex. But interestingly, I want to talk to you about the exhibition that you did recently, which was with a contemporary sound artist who is not from the Mishtek region actually, and who doesn't play contemporary Mishtek instruments, but who definitely based his entire project on this codex. The art residency at the SD Sealer at the British Museum led to the creation of the electroacoustic soundscape called Sanyu, which has been for me a truly significant project in which I was able to investigate on the mixed decoracies, particularly the Tonindaya Codex, and assimilate the narratives, context, language, and relevance that these documents have for the Mesoamerican cultures of the present. It seems relevant to me that historical documents, manuscripts, archaeological pieces and objects, as well as ancestral spaces and enclosures, are studied not only by researchers, historians, and scientists, but also that artists can approach and contribute with their imagination and creativity to reinterpret history, to tell it and show it in new and interesting ways. Sound art and music, as well as any type of art, are of great relevance to the mixed deck culture. Sound as an element as a symbol 
is included in its manuscripts, but also in traditions, daily dynamics, and in language itself. There is a firm conviction that listening is a fundamental way for understanding the relationship between people and nature. Today, studies on soundscapes and acoustic ecology reinforce the importance of sound to understand our natural and urban context, which tell us about the interactions of elements, the movement of time, people and natural species. The mixed texts have known this forever, and in their language we can find concepts such as Cayu, which means the sound of trees, or ndakama, the sound of moving water, or chasonyu, that stands for listen the world. Sound is what enables relationship, connection, and recognition. It seems transcendental to retake or to keep alive the connection with sound as a practice, as a ritual, but also as art and music. So do you want to tell me a little bit about how um, how that project first started and how he got interested in the Codex? Definitely. So the artist's name is Jorge Martinez Valderrama, and he is a Mexican artist based in Mexico City. And he is he's an artist that fundamentally works in, digi in digital media, right? So he he doesn't usually play instruments, but he does stuff on his computer. That's sort of the difference. He manipulates sounds with his with his computer. <laughs> exactly. Right? Uh, can you describe the exhibition briefly? Sure. So the exhibition was held at the UK Mexican Art Society, which is near um, Euston Station, if you're familiar with London, but if not, it's in central London. And basically on the outside of the of the gallery, there was a rendition of the of the Mishtek landscape from Jorge's fieldwork. And so it was it was manipulated uh, as as is typical in his work, but it was manipulated to have like blue orange neon colors. So it was sort of um Yeah, it was sort of depicting like a traditional landscape. It had cactuses, it had plants that one would imagine, I guess, are in Mexico, um, but then became much more contemporary with, with the choice of color. And when you entered the exhibit, you had some wall text on your right-hand side, and then you had all the clay birds on the wall that were examples of instruments that were used in the artwork. And then when you entered, you were sort of immersed in his like visual soundscape. So you had a giant screen in front of you, and you had... a uh, five speakers surrounding you. And then on the outside of the exhibit, there was also something that um, he called a spectrotopogram. So it was basically like Jorge uses all these like digital programs to, to edit the music. And so he exported part of his artwork, which showed these spectrograms, which are just like visual representations of sounds. And then working with a designer, Lisa Rejón, he edited these to sort of mimic the Mishtek landscape. So it was sort of like a play on the idea of his whole work, which was based on sound, but then completed with, with the visuals from the area. Yeah, it sort of evokes the landscape, doesn't it, through, through sound. And then that particular spectrogram was a visual representation of a map almost. But inside the map, the contents of that graph, if you want, was the sounds that you could hear inside the gallery. Yes. And so his, his artistic practice sort of is based on going into the field and recording different sounds from the landscape and, and manipulating these in, into like a full piece. And so when we invited Jorge to do a digital artist residency at the museum, he was first interested in these musical instruments we have in the collection. So we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these like clay instruments. A lot of them are animal shaped. A lot of them are are sort of maybe more abstract animal shapes. But but yeah, we have a lot of, of clay birds, I guess you can call them in the collection, which is also the name of his of his final work or bird's clay. But yeah, so Jorge was interested in the musical instruments, and he also participated in these weekly sem seminars we had with indigenous archaeologists from, from central Mexico, from the Mixtec region, and from the Maya region. 
And he got particularly interested uh, on the Toninde Codex because he was fascinated by the metaphorical languages that we discussed in another episode. And so those metaphorical languages, just to go over them if you haven't heard the other episode, is they're called the Frasismos and and he was interested in how two separate words um, converge to create a third meaning. And so he's done this kind of symbolically with the sounds and with the visuals in his artwork. And so he's taken two different sounds that are completely unrelated and sort of mixes them and, and does does different digital manipulations to create new sounds, which I think is really interesting. It's a beautiful idea, um, this sort of music that sort of gets deeper and deeper and deeper, doesn't it? Because he keeps creating more and more texture. Wasn't there also an element to that piece in the end, that sound piece, in which he incorporated some of the sounds made by replicas of those Mesoamerican animal-shaped instruments? Definitely. So so there's a couple different aspects to his artwork. So he first um, worked with this Mixtec uh, musician called Luis García Acevedo from the group Yellow Quincy. And he worked with him to create a, a very different spectra of sounds from these instruments, from replicas of different instruments. A lot of these instruments were made by Mario Cortes Vergara, who has an ancestral practice of creating these ceramics for four generations plus. And so... Those sounds in in his artwork uh, remain untouched. So Jorge politically chose not to edit any of the elements that were made by his indigenous collaborators as a show of reference to to their work. And so he had so first he had the recordings of those instruments that were made by Luis. Second, he had the voice of Nadia Nusavi, who's an indigenous uh, Mixtec poet. And then third, he had recordings, um, audio recordings in the Mishtek landscape um, where he went on field work. And as an extra element, which is not usual of, of Jorge's practice, is he integrated uh, a, a, a vis the visual landscape. So there is video also with this uh, final artwork. And so he sort of um, replicates not only the language in the codex um, throughout the sounds and through the video, but he also replicates like specific scenes in the codex. So one of the scenes you were talking about in a different episode where they put hallucinogenic ointment on their skin, this uh, black ointment, and they have visions and connections with the oneric world, so that is also represented in his artwork. Within the narratives described in every mix the codex, there is a constant reference to visionary experiences, revelations, omens, and premonitions. The use of plants, mushroom, cacti, and other stimulants, or hallucinogens, was very important to achieve these visions or warnings about transcendental events. They were a source of wisdom, power, and healing, used particularly in ritual ceremonies, dances, and songs. We can learn about the rituals with sacred mushrooms, such as the story of the first dawn, in the Codex Yutano or Vindavonensis, and the visit of eight deer to the Temple of Dead in the plate 44 of the Tonindeye Codex, where there were the Nahuatl priest, Yaha Yawi, who were attributed supernatural powers. They could communicate with the underworld. We can also see people in different scenes using a black paint, which also had visionary properties. The way to integrate this concept into my piece, Sanyu, was through the distortion or dislocation of the audiovisual material, generated by the fragmentation of the images and the alteration of time, pitch, and timbre of the sound. In this way, the work also acquires its own alternative state that allows us to discover other forms and deeper nuances within the soundscape. Yeah, it's, I, I, I really enjoyed that part of the, of the video where basically you start to see the sort of image almost collapse or kind of create a kaleidoscope. And it does feel very much like it's the feeling of being in a trance or of sounds and colors and images kind of merging what i liked about the trance the trance like images and sounds in that piece is it's that yes it references lord eight deer and lord 12 movement being painted with hallucinogenic ointment getting ready to go and see lady nine grass at the temple of death and to me it's that you know that whole the ritual act of, of going through all of those motions and taking hallucinogenic substances is all about the seriousness of what it means to engage 
in, in ancestral knowledge and ancestral practice in, in the case of the Codex. Um, but it did make me think of an engagement generally uh, with a museum, which is also a ritual space. And we come into this museum and we see objects that, that are really deep, like the Dunyandea Codex. Often they're behind glass and we kind of look at them as being something from other people made them and they were important to other people. And now we see them as being just beautiful and they tell us about history and it's quite cold. It would be interesting, wouldn't it, to to walk into a museum and have a much more emotional connection to Definitely. And I, and I think what Hoda's work sort of does is it activates your senses in a way that like one can imagine would happen in the codex, right? It, it makes it sort of digestible to understand these like complicated meta- metaphorical languages, which which aren't that easy to translate into everyday life. And so once you're in Hoda's artwork, that bit where, where it, it becomes very overwhelming and you're suddenly like seeing loads of images it gets very dark the image and then uh, it's on a five um five channel speakers and uh, every side of the speaker is hitting you with like sounds and and everybody who went to the exhibit really felt like very overwhelmed which, which i think is is the feeling you're supposed to feel in that bit of the codex right it's sort of translating the emotion of that of that scene yeah i certainly think that a mishtech reader of that document hundreds of years ago, would not have read it with any kind of cold, discerning, interpretative eye, right? They would have read it as evoking in them whatever similar experiences they might have had in their ritual engagement. Definitely. And and it would be great to see this in the museum, sort of next to the Codex, and and to see different interpretations of the Codex, right? Because Jorge is not the first contemporary artist, um, nor the last, that will use the Codex as inspiration. Yeah, I mean, to me, I think the project with Jorge Martinez does champion the importance, doesn't it, of using contemporary methods like sound art to kind of push people to to see museums as a space in which you are supposed to feel something and understand something sensorially uh, and aesthetically rather than just intellectually. The way to understand it also is important. So I think there is narratives in the codex, and we've we've talked about this a lot. And like how these narratives are explained is not how narratives in museums are explained, right? And so understanding the different ways that people express themselves, I think, is really important also to to getting a bit closer to understanding these objects. So I just wanted to ask you about the title. So the title of the exhibition is Birds Clay which doesn't actually make any sense in English. Yeah, so Bird's Clay is a difrasismo that Jorge, the artist, um, made up. So it's Bird's Clay or, or Sanyu in, in my very poor Mishtek pronunciation. He basically joined, joined these two words to create another meaning, which is the music produced by them, right? So instead of just birds or just clay... It's the music produced by these um, zoomorphic instruments. And so in the artwork, when you when you try to listen to the bits that are nature, it's actually only the clay birds, the clay instruments, and all the parts that don't sound like nature that one would, I guess, attribute to instruments are actually his manipulations of, of the natural landscape. And so are there any actual sounds of, let's say, birds in, ne- like in nature in the recording? I think, I think there is like a couple... In the background, like I don't think it was the main focus, but um, I don't think you'll be able to identify them like that. So anything that actually sounds like birds isn't isn't a bird. It's a clay bird. It's a clay bird. Yeah. You mentioned that it is a collaborative project that he, that Jorge Martinez did not work alone. So who who are the people that he worked with? Definitely. So he has, I guess, um, I would say four four main collaborators. Um, firstly, I mentioned before Luis García Acevedo from the group Yolo Quincy. He recorded all of the sounds of instruments that you're going to hear throughout the art piece. And then we have Nadia Nusavi, um, who is a Mishtek poet, and she is the voice that is in the artwork, which also remains unmanipulated. And then Mario Gortas Vergara is the creator of the clay birds and a lot of these ancestral instruments, a fourth generation ceramicist who created um, also the instruments we use in the installation. Then we have Marco Antonio Lara, who is a longtime collaborator of Jorge Martinez, and he did the visuals and the visual editing um, for the piece. Yeah, so really it was a group show, wasn't it, in lots of ways. And what do you think that Jorge took away from the project in terms of collaborating with indigenous artists and creators. So I think uh, Jorge, because he participated every week in seminars that were that was led in our research center um, discussing the codex from indigenous perspectives, 
and also participated in seminars trying to decipher the codex with contemporary indigenous languages. I think it was maybe his first opportunity to to collaborate in this way with indigenous communities. And I think by hearing all of these people's political point of views on heritage, um, it really influenced his work. By not editing any of any of his collaborators' work, he really made a political stance on on how important it is to to respect descendants of ancestral heritage. The experience of collaborating with mystic artists such as Luis Garcia and the poet Nadia Nyosavi has been extremely enriching because it allowed me to be much more sensitive in the creative process in having a really meaningful approach with the context and the artistic search of the piece. The collaboration with Luis allowed me to know aspects of the musical use of the instruments, what they represent at a symbolic and cultural level, the reason for their morphology, the distinction between the musical instrument and the sound object. With Nadia, I learned about the importance of sound in the memory of communities, how a sound or a word resonates deep within people and connects with their past and present, with their loved ones, and also with nature and everything that surrounds them. I think their contribution has been extremely valuable because the work became a platform for expression, participation, collaboration, exchange, dialogue, listening, and communion. In this comment, Jorge mentions Luis Garcia, who is part of the band Yolo Quincy, which uses ancestral mistrack instruments to create contemporary music. Listen to Luis on the continuity of the use of these instruments and how he got involved with mistrack music. It's kind of hard to talk about continuity in mystic music because history is not linear, you know, especially among indigenous cultures. Currently in the Mixteca region, There are different traditional genres like chilenas, pasodobles, sones, jarabes uh, that are played by different instrumental ensembles. Mm, For example, there are wind bands, basically brass ensembles with trumpets, trombones, tuba, sometimes clarinets, and more recently added saxophones, this type of Ensembles were born in the early 20th century. Um, There are other traditional ensembles with strings like violins, double bass, um, an instrument called bajo quinto, which is similar to a guitar. And in those type of ensembles, sometimes they use a clay jar as a percussion. Currently, wooden drums and flutes made out of reed are played in traditional dances. These flutes probably have their origin in the pre-Columbian times, as we can see them in the Tonindeje Codex, also called Nutal Codex. And the wooden drums are most likely adaptations of European military drums that were made during the colony. On the other hand, an instrument that has its origin in the pre-Columbian times is the teponasli, also called ku, and it's currently played among Mixtecos, Nahuas and Tlapanecos in the mountain region of the state of Guerrero in rain request ceremonies. We can also talk about continuity in the meaning and symbolism of music. Although with a clear European influence in the melodies, we can still find songs for harvest in Mixteco language. So I first knew these instruments because my uncles founded a band that makes music with pre-Columbian instruments back in 1987 or so. This band is called Jodo Quincy, and Jodo Quincy is also their native town, which is in the Mixteca region of Oaxaca. So when I was a child, I would watch my uncle's rehearsal and play these instruments, and these sounds just captivated me. When you're growing up, you imitate what you see. So I joined Jodo Quincy when I was like five years old or so, and I became a musician. But instead of learning music through a guitar or a piano, I learned playing wooden drums and clay flutes. I learned music through ancient instruments. There are actually two Mishtek de Bonasli that Luis describes from the British Museum's collection. We've discussed them, but these are slit drums carved out with wood. 
If you want to hear Yodo Quince's music, you can find them on YouTube or on Spotify. Yodo Quince is spelt Y-O-D-O-Q-U-I-N-S-I. So the use of contemporary art to kind of fracture the sort of empiricist vision or the or the educational vision of anthropology and history collections has been critiqued a little bit, right? So why do you think that... What do you think of Jorge de Martinez's work in the context of those kinds of criticisms of contemporary art? Definitely. And, and, and just to be more explicit about the criticism, the criticism is about um, non-descendant communities working with ancestral material. I think it's, it's complex, and I, I don't know if I have a, a final opinion on this, but I think that when these respectful collaborations are in place... Um, this is a way to disseminate um, ancestral culture and to platform indigenous voices. And so I think in that, in that way, it's good. I don't know if I agree when these types of collaborations aren't done in a way that people get something out of it in the same way. When contemporary artists appropriate and take advantage of indigenous and ancestral heritage without, I think, respectful collaboration, then it does become inappropriate for for history and anthropology museums to work with them. But I think that's sort of our role in this, and, it, and our role is, is to make sure that type of thing doesn't happen, right? When you're on from the stabbing in the Temazcal, Lord Adir comes for them. He overpowers the town, claims the two eldest son of Lord Levin Wind are responsible. Vengeance, he claims pain ahead to pay for the pain behind. The rulers of the town and their family are arrested. He enters the room to see Lady Six Monkey, his once true love. There have been 18 years since the temple of death and the boys there that snapped the strings in his heart. They have not seen each other since that day and in the space of that room, the time from them to now shrinks to an instant. The breath of the wind on that hillside still brushes them. She sees a world that might have been, and a man she might have loved once, but does not love now. She sees a man that she knew at the back of the eyes of this warrior king, but she knows the man before her is not that man. And he sees on her face a world that might have been, but it is not the world they inhabit. And so he sheds no tear when he condemns them to die and vengeance for a murder he knows they did not commit. And as Lady Six Monkey and Lord Eleven Wind and the two eldest sons are marched through the ceremonial center, none shed a tear. And as the four heads of the ruling family of the town are slipped with knives and killed, the Lord's sun shines in the sky. The sun sees all and judges all and knows that there will be retribution. In the last episode, we will explore contemporary codices that are currently being made in Mexico and along the Mexico-US border. We're going to discuss the different approaches to making these contemporary codices, including their creative content as well as their political messages. This and more in our next session. Until next time. The epic of Lord A. Deer was read aloud by Miguel Villegas Ventura. This creative reinterpretation, scripted by Jack Monaghan, is based on the Tonintelle and other mystic codices that mention Lord A. Deer's story. We are particularly indebted to the book, Encounter with the Plum Serpent, Drama and Power in the Heart of Mesoamerica by Martin Jensen and Gavina Aurora Perez Jimenez. And the play, Recreation of the History Told in the Mishte Codices by the community theater, Yeonyu Sabi, directed by Maria Ofelia Porras Lescas. This podcast season is made possible by the generosity of Alejandro and Charlotte Santo Domingo and Mrs. Julio Mario Santo Domingo with Andres and Lauren Santo Domingo. If you want to know more about the Santo Domingo Center, please visit SD Cellar website, sdcellarbritishmuseum.org. This podcast was recorded, engineered, and edited by Prong Productions. For more information on Prong, please visit prongproductions.com. That's P-R-O-N-K productions.com.